And if you'll stand with me, I'll read our text for today. We're going to just go through verse 7. It says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness, and deny the only Lord God, And our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. One of the shortest books of the Bible, kind of a trio of three very short books in a row, This epistle of Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, the brother of James, is a very neglected book. Uh, In fact, man, you know, it it sometimes seems like it's overshadowed by that very last book, the Revelation, you know. Uh, We are going into Revelation next in our study through the Word, and we're excited about that. I'm really stirred and excited to go through the Revelation after being here for almost 10 years and walking through the New Testament, excited to be at the end and to be here in, in, uh, in this section. But how quickly, even in our own devotional time, in our own quiet times, do we bust through the book of Jude just to hop back to that book of prophecy, you know? And uh, man, we just don't want to neglect this epistle of Jude, uh, an epistle that starts out with the gospel, starts out with great hope. Three weeks ago, we looked at this when we saw in his introduction He's speaking to those who are called, who are called by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ through the foreknowledge of the Lord, through the election of the Lord. There's a calling for those who would believe, and and that's kind of a past tense thing, followed by a present tense thing called sanctification. You'll see it there in verse 1. We're set apart from the world, just as the children of Israel are an example to us of being set apart from the world of Egypt as they're brought out of that worldly nation and brought through the waters of baptism of the Red Sea, if you will, uh, as they eat of that bread in the wilderness, of that picture of the feasting upon Jesus, just day by day they would be set apart from the world of Egypt. So too is the Christian set apart from the old ways. And it was so cool. It's so neat to hear the testimonies of Christians. And we spent a lot of time sharing testimonies in Nepal. And just to look at one another and and just to hear of where they were apart from Christ and where we are now in Christ Jesus. It's an exciting, wonderful thing to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit, set apart from the world. And with that, that future tense hope of being preserved in Jesus Christ, that we will make it to the end. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it into that day of Christ Jesus. There's wonderful hope in this gospel that was given to uh, whoever it was that Jude was writing to. But in a sense, the gospel is bookend in this small book. You also see towards the end in verse 21 that that preservation or that keeping keeps on keeping on. And it's something that the believer needs to do regularly in their lives. They need to keep themselves in the love of God, looking at that mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, looking unto eternal life, having that 
goal in view, but there's also the hope in verse 24 that it is him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to preserve you and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So I point all of that out as I was also stirred in my studying to know that the gospels at the beginning, at the end of this great treatise against apostates, as is the apostle is going to go into kind of a rant in a sense. He's going to tell us how he really feels concerning those who have uh, been leading people astray, who've fallen away from the faith. And we don't want to lose sight of our own standing in the Lord and the hope that even these wicked men could have in Christ Jesus should they repent of their sin. And also that he will keep us to that day by his grace. And so uh, having all of that in mind, with mercy and peace and love multiplied to us as we see in verse 2. Check out verse 3. Saying, Beloved, as I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. And so, It appears that Jude had an initial purpose behind a letter, and you know, there wasn't the delete button, you know, that we could just easily change topics in the middle of an email. You know, he was was going for it and just put the brakes on as he sensed the Holy Spirit saying, there's something even more pressing right now than, than a wonderful thing of writing about the gospel, common salvation, something to rejoice in, something to take great comfort in, but uh, man, there's some things going on. And, and it's concerning those who are creeping in and leading people astray. And so I've got to just exhort you and encourage you with strong encouragement that it's time to be a contender, all right? It's time to labor, it's time to strain, it's time to work out, and it's time to contend for the gospel, Uh, That phrase, contend, we studied it a few weeks ago, but it has something of the same tense of to agonize. It's it's a tense of epi-agonizo, to agonize in the labor, to agonize in the race, to agonize in the fight, in the wrestling match, to put great effort into reasoning with people, uh, to take great effort to explain to people the gospel, to stand up for truth, to champion and to, to wave the banner of the word of God, which is truth. And uh, so wonderful to come back from Nepal and to have been with a team that spent time reasoning with uh, Israelis, to reason with Germans, agnostics, and to just spend time with, with actually some fair inquirers out there and to spend time just reasoning with them concerning the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. It was a fantastic time uh, with those out on the field. And, uh, and so even today in 2019, this contending is something that must happen in the Christian's life. And I just want to encourage you, are you equipped Have you spent time studying the word and plowing those straight lines through the scriptures uh, and studying the scriptures and being made a disciple, being taught the things that Jesus commands so that you can be a part of this contending uh, that would take place of the faith? And uh, three weeks ago, we looked at, through the book of Acts, those times that uh, Paul the Apostle would reason with people, would spend times in the marketplaces and in the synagogues reasoning and, and having those arguments and even having those times of, of just real intense communication with others about Jesus, the Christ, the Savior of the world. As Paul the Apostle would spend time before rulers, it says he would reason about self-control, he would reason about sin, he would reason about the judgment to come. And one of those rulers in the book of Acts would say to Paul, Man, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Remember that? You almost persuade me to become a Christian like you. And he says, man, I, I don't just want you to just be a Christian. I want you to be everything that I have. I want you to have everything that I have concerning all, our salvation and the Lord Jesus. And so we looked at this a few weeks ago. 
uh, concerning this agonizing, concerning this contending earnestly, and I, I made the dumb joke a few weeks ago, but doesn't it have a little bit of that Rocky Balboa in it? Like, I should have been a contender, you know? And I'd hate for you to get to the end of your life and be like on your deathbed, like, man, I missed out. I should have been a contender, you know? It's like, yeah, the Lord has that for you, to be a part of the contending for the faith. And I even bet that the Lord has someone within your circles this week that in your conversation, it's time to take it to the next notch. It's time to just stop skirting around the truth. It's time to begin to drop the gospel bomb, you know, and just start preaching about sin and sin in your own life and your testimony and sin in our culture, sin in our worldviews and sin in this individual's life that they too will have to answer for the things that they've done in their body, in their heart, in their nature. And they will stand before God in judgment, but that there's good news, there's calling, there's sanctification, there's hope, there's eternal life found in Christ Jesus. If one would turn from their sins and put their hope and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who am I kidding? This might not be someone at your work. This might be you here this morning. You ever think about that? Maybe you are the one. You've come to this place and you have not yet put your trust in the Lord Jesus. You are still a sin, a sinner without hope in this world. But even today, right now where you're at, you can just bow the knee Bow your heart before Jesus and say, I am a sinner destined for judgment and I need your grace and your hope and forgiveness in my life. And you know what? Right now where you're at, he will give you his grace. He will give you his mercy. He will give you his peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, the great translator of the 1940s, J.B. Phillips, helped translate this verse, verse three. He says, I feel compelled to make my letter to you an earnest appeal that you would put up a real fight for the faith. And so as we get in the book of Jude, we're going to see that, man, we've got to put up a real fight in the faith against a form of apostates that uh, it's laid out pretty clear uh, what these guys preach and teach. And of course, we can bring um, modern day application and understand how it's happening even in our world today. Uh, As people are coming against this gospel, coming against the faith, look at the end of verse 3, that was once for all delivered to the saints. There's an unchangingness about the gospel. There's an unchangeableness about our faith. It's not something that has morphed and changed over the last 2,000 years and and whatever the culture might bring, then we kind of morph to fit the culture. No, there is a truth and it is absolute and it's based upon a God of truth. It's from a God of truth who's the same yesterday, he's the same today, he's the same forever, and he does not change. His standards of holiness haven't changed. His standards of judgment have never changed. And yet, at the same time, he gives mercy as he gives out judgment. And we see that at the cross of the Lord Jesus. At the cross, we see judgment poured out upon the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. But we also see mercy towards sinners and that anyone who would look to Jesus and believe upon Jesus their sins would be judged there at the cross and they would find mercy and salvation through that work of Jesus. But there's an attack against that. There's a morphing, there's a changing. In our country, we call it, and in our culture, we call it progressivism. Progressivism, or even something that's really a a blight against what was once a beautiful phrase in Christianity, and that is reform. In fact, many churches today call themselves reformed and reforming. In other words, changing to adapt to the culture. But in that, they're throwing out truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And let me quote to you just a great quote from Alistair Begg on this. He says, when you go wrong on the doctrine of the atonement, that is that the blood of Jesus washes away sin, it's only a matter of time that everything else follows. Christianity bears testimony of what happens when men drift from the moorings of authentic, historical Christian faith. And by the way, that's what you'll hear here at Calvary Chapel. You will, we will be tethered to the moorings, the anchor of the authentic, historical Christian faith. Uh, it goes on to say, when those begin to view Christianity as a process toward understanding God, 
When that happens, virtually any view may be entertained. Any view may be tolerated just as long as this insight does not claim finality. And we see that in our culture, right? We see that any view is tolerated unless it claims truth, unless it claims finality. Then all of a sudden that coexistence uh, no longer wants to coexist, okay? And that was some of our preaching in Nepal was that there is a truth. Truth isn't relative. Truth is something that, that has moorings, that has historical groundings. And it was just, it was a wonderful time with the Holy Spirit just bringing the words to help reason with people that there is truth and we can find truth. And that's not some, you know, hopeful utopia that's out there. That is something that, that is something that we can find even today in the word of God. And in church history, everything from the church fathers, from the apostles, from, from John Bunyan and Whitfield and Charles Spurgeon, they would all face accusations because they would claim finality. And in our day and ages, we claim finality. Uh, we will be attacked and persecuted as well. So what are we supposed to be contending against uh, in this Christian life? Look at verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, here's a little bit of context behind the contending, and that is that there are certain men, there are specific men who sneak in. They, it says they've crept in. So just think of that for a minute. Don't let that get past you. Think of those times when you have had to do some creeping. What does that look like? For me this morning, it was maybe I can get by Tatum's room without her knowing that I'm awake. And then there's this one floorboard right there. I've literally Googled how to walk like a ninja. And it actually works. It's, it's actually toe first, then heel. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Or no, heel first, then toe. You would do it the other way. I know, Jeff. Uh, but uh, yeah, and it didn't work. She woke up, no, you know, lickety split, wanted her chocolate milk. What does it look like, though, as we creep? Well, it looks creepy, all right? Uh, you look like a creep, okay? Uh, there's nothing good about it, really, okay? And that's the case with these certain men. They are sneaking into the church, okay? They are slipping in stealthily. They slide into a group, all right? It takes slime to slide, by the way, uh, they slide in, you know, they don't show up at a conference at the front door saying something like, hey, I'm just here to challenge the insufficiency in, of the word of God. I'm here to, you know, uh, put a mark on uh, historical Christianity by throwing out this opinion. And, you know, of course not. You know, these aren't people that want to be fair. They want to come in and they want to sneak on in and, uh, and creep in. Uh, and that's hard to do, though, when an alarm is set. And so as Christians, we're to kind of set the front door alarm. You know, we're to have our radars up. We're to have our sensibilities uh, on, you know, the spidey sense, if you will, is to be waiting to hear those key words and phrases that would show that this individual is creeping in. The book of Galatians shows that this is something that uh, was to be on guard against as those creeps had come into the Asian churches in Galatia. In fact, the language that's used there is that men who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ have come in. Later on, it says of them that their false brethren secretly brought in. So they're secretly brought in, and it says that they came in by stealth to spy out the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they could bring us into bondage, okay? So that's the kind of stuff that Jude is talking about here. Coming in stealthily, spying out freedoms so that they can bring us into bondage. Adrian Rogers points out in his book, Snakes in the Garden, that these are people who received the truth, but then they rejected the truth they ridicule the truth, and now they seek to replace the truth. And that's a pretty good progression of what happens in these 
movements and among these creepers is that there's a reception, but then a rejection, a ridiculing of it, and then a replacement of it. Ephesians speaks of them as coming with cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. Timothy tells us that they creep into households and make captives of gullible women. And Peter tells us that they secretly bring in destructive heresies. Tim Shaddix writes that we see the effects of this tragic progressivism in schools like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Columbia, Brown, and the University of Chicago, all which were founded to train up ministers to propagate the gospel. Today, none of them stands for historic Christian orthodoxy. We also see the demise and death of once great denominations that no longer send gospel missionaries. They deny the inerrancy of the scriptures. They reject the exclusive claims of Christ. They ordain practicing homosexuals to the ministry. They advocate same-sex marriage and perform same-sex weddings. And they turn a deaf ear to the Holocaust of abortion. So those are just some ways that over the course of time, this progression of what Rogers says, receiving, rejecting, ridiculing, and then replacing the truth, this is where it leads us. And you can, almost, you can just bet it's going to happen. You can see someone in the place of rejecting truth of the word, even in little areas, and you say, you know what, I can already tell you what's down the path next in this progressive culture. The next thing that's going to, it's embracing this type of sin. It's winking at this type of sin. It's embracing this type of sin, and, and so on and so forth. This progressive culture that we have, winking at sin, rejecting the Bible that, pro, that uh, proclaims repentance from sin, and then replacing the gospel with any and every other form of self-help and false gospel. So let me just give you 12 important things that I would consider, and that this is actually not just me, this is Orthodox Christianity that has been delivered to the saints. These are 12 non-negotiables that Scripture and church history embrace as closed-handed issues, things that we will never waver on as a church. And it's going to be fast. Uh, I can share my notes later, but uh, these are things that probably are, are nothing real new to you anyways. But 12 things here that we believe are orthodox essentials of the Christian faith. Number one, the inerrancy and infallibility of the Scriptures. Okay, so the, the authority of the Scripture, the truth of the Scripture, that it is without error. It's a big, huge study. We've done it many times at this church. Look forward to going through it with you again. Uh, we always come back around because it's so important uh, to know that the, uh, the Scriptures have the authority for us. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, right? Uh, secondly, the full and eternal deity of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So that's the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, three persons in one Godhead. Uh, thirdly, the miraculous virgin birth and the sinless life of Jesus the Messiah. The, his fourth, the historical creation of man and woman made in God's image. The sanctity of all life from, con from conception to natural death. The sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman. The sinfulness of all human people. The substitutionary death of Christ for sinners. The bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Number 11, the exclusivity of of the gospel of Jesus Christ for sinners. So he is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved than the name Jesus Christ. 
and 12, the return of Jesus and the assignment of all people either to eternal blessedness in heaven or eternal condemnation in hell. And so the creepers come in unnoticed trying to steal us away from those uh, essential truths. It says in verse 4 that long ago they were marked out for this condemnation. God is not surprised by this. He has spoken to us before in his word about them and what he plans to do with them, that if they do not repent, they are condemned as ungodly men. Now, this uh, phrase here, uh, turning, uh, let's see here, let's, uh, turning the grace of God into lewdness, you see that there's an exchange that takes place in their doctrine and theology. There is a transferring that takes place. There is a turning of the grace of God into lewdness. There's a transfer of God's gracious gift of salvation and purity and holiness to the believer, eternal life to the one by grace, and that transfers to sensuality. It's a transfer to licentiousness. It speaks of being sexually unchaste, lacking moral restraints. Just think of that change of of the gospel of Jesus transferring over to obscene vulgarity. Greek scholar Douglas Moo says that this word turning connotes especially sins to the flesh, sexual misconduct, drunkenness, and gluttony. And Douglas Moo in his Greek studying says, these are antinomians. What's that? It's those who want no rules, no restraint, and no one telling them what they should or should not do. My generation would remember it as, don't tell me what I can or cannot do when I rock. All right? Um, That's antinomianism. No rules, don't tell me what to do. Uh, There's no call towards purity in the gospel, through the gospel, by the gospel. And uh, sadly, we see this revival within the thinking in our own day among progressive uh, evangelicals. They love grace, but they sneer at calls towards holiness and purity and forsaking the ways of the world. Grace is without repentance. And just listen to what a couple of the other translations say of this verse. The English Standard Version says that they pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Okay, now we've all heard of perverts, right? But what does that mean? It means that it's crooked. That's what pervert means. It makes something that was straight crooked. Well, there was a crooked man, and he had a crooked smile. He walked a crooked leg, and he walked a crooked mile. Okay, sorry. I mentioned my aunt authored We Sing, and I sang on many of the albums. It's probably how you know me. Um, We Sing children's tapes. Okay. A pervert is a crooked man. Okay, they walk that crooked mile. And these false teachers, these creeps, all right, they pervert the gospel of Christ. They turn it into something that's crooked, namely It's something that's sensual. The NIV, New International Version, says it perverts the grace of our God into a license for immorality. So what does that mean? It means that we take grace and we say, I'm saved by grace. But then we use that as some sort of a identity card, some sort of a passport for sin. And so we go and we sin. And then we fall back on, whatever, man, grace, dude, it's all cool. And then we sin again. When really that grace changes our heart so that we don't want to sin anymore. We realize what it costs the Lord. We realize what the purpose is behind grace. And it changes us by the Spirit of God. It moves us to not want to sin anymore. As Romans tells us, as it says that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, Or where sin abounds, grace superabounds. And so if we didn't read the next verse, we'd think, well, then I ought to just go ahead and sin a whole bunch so that God's grace would come all the more. Woo, party, yeah. Praise God for grace. All right? 
Well, then the question is asked in Romans 6.1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. And really, it's not even a question of like, should we do this or shouldn't we? Well, I don't know. You decide. Well, okay. I decide yes. Well, I decided no. Okay, no big deal. I guess we agree to disagree. That's not what's going on here. As you look at the rest of this verse, Romans 6, 2, how shall we who've died to sin live any longer in it? So do you see how it's just not even a possibility for the born-again Christian? Because what grace does is it's through faith that we're nailed to the cross with Jesus. Our flesh is pinned to the cross. I've been crucified with Christ, Galatians tells us. Nevertheless, I live. And the life that I now live is by faith in the Lord Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. So how have we who through the gospel have died to sin continue to live in it? When that sanctifying work of Jude 1 tells us that we are being set apart from that junk. We don't want to do it anymore because Jesus is more precious. Jesus is more precious than any rebellion we could ever muster up. Forgive me for quoting Beg one more time in our message, but he says, when sin is dealt with lightly, when freedom is expressed in lawlessness, when we dismiss the concern of our forebearers, the earlier generations for purity and for holiness as simply being legalistic tendencies of some crazy people who are close to being dead, then, my loved ones, we are closer to this perversion then we are prepared to admit. In other words, it's something good to hear from grandmas and grandpas about these things and not just go, oh, you're just old-fashioned. You know, you're just from the coat and tie generation. You know, what do you know? Man, in humility, we ought to hear and reason from the word about sin and righteousness and self-control as Christians. Ralph Davis Uh, a, a pastor and a scholar of our day on the misunderstandings of the use of calling to holiness and specifically with the law, the Ten Commandments. He says, not only is the schoolmaster of the law to bring us to Christ, but once we've been pointed to Christ, then we would be returned to the law to frame our way of life. I know some Christians have allergic reactions when they're told they're subject to God's moral law. This, uh, this, the fear, is legalism and an effort to salvation by works. But that fear misunderstands the function of the law. The law comes in the context of grace. Listen to this. Keep that in mind. The law comes in the context of grace. Yahweh lays down the pattern for us in Exodus. He delivers his people, then he demands. He works his redemption before he sets down his requirements. He first sets Israel free and then tells them how that freedom is to be enjoyed and maintained. Listen to the last quote here from Davis. Glad obedience to God's moral law is simply our logical act of worship. So we don't try to keep the law in our own strength so that perhaps we can, you know, at the end of the day have done more good than bad and have appeased God so that we have finally earned our way to salvation. No, instead we have rested in what Jesus has done at the cross and that he has fulfilled the law and the prophets. He has done what I could never do because I'm weak in the flesh. He came as the hero and as heaven of heaven, the hero of heaven. He delighted to do the will of God and yet he was murdered and killed on a criminal's cross for the sins of the world. As I trust and rest in what he's done for me, All of his goodness and perfection is put into my account through faith. I have fulfilled the law already 
because of what Jesus has done. When, Jesus, when God the Father looks at me, he looks at me through the cross of Jesus. And he sees a Rory that has never not kept the law. And he didn't leave us as orphans when he ascended to heaven, but he sent the Holy Spirit. He's changed our hearts now. He's given us a new nature. And he's caused us to want to now obey the word of God as that reasonable, logical act of worship. Bought and paid for by grace, motivated by grace. Now we live for him. But the false teachers would want to exchange grace for lewdness, for licentiousness, for antinomianism, which is just living for the pleasures of this world without the word of God giving us the the way and how to live. It's amazing how these things creep in to the church through ungodly men. That word ungodly in verse 4 speaks of unpious or impious, which speaks of that they're not religious. And you've heard me mention this before. We come from an age, in Calvary Chapel even, where, where we hate the religion that has those three R's, you know, just rules and rituals and regulations, And yet, those are merely external forms of religion. There's a biblical good religion that comes from a changed life, from the internal transformation of the Holy Spirit and the work of the gospel in the lives of Christians where we live out lives that are pious, lives that are holy, lives that are pure, lives that desire to worship God in everything we do, lives that desire to glorify God and be about his task. And yet, these men are impious, ungodly men. Those that have turned the grace of our God into lewdness. And the second thing here is that they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so very quickly, as we're wrapping up, as we look at the epistle of Jude, it's easy for us to kind of begin to pick out ministries in our day and age and in our culture that we would say fall into this apostate category. And yet, if we're using the book of Jude as our ruler, we want to be very careful on who we would call out as heretics, okay? Uh, Are these people who have crept in, are they ungodly and unpious? Are they those who have literally exchanged the gospel for uh, antinomianism and, and sexual immorality and licentiousness in every way? And are, and are they those who have denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ? Have they done that? And I would say in my research, many have and many haven't. And as we study something like this, we, we looked at this in our introduction a few weeks ago. We want to have humble hearts that are prayerful for these movements and these churches and these individuals that cry out for their souls, that cry out for their repentance. As we quoted from D.L. Moody weeks ago, that, man, I I don't want to teach about hell and the condemnation towards apostates without a tear in my eye. These are eternities that we're talking about. These are eternities upon eternities, as these often have movements associated to them. So we come with humility, examining our own hearts, checking any plank for any planks in our own eyes, and then looking at the criteria in our context of the book of Jude. Are they creepers? Are they ungodly? Have they turned God's grace into lewdness? Do they deny, and by the way, in the Greek here, it's one and the same, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord God. Have they denied him? Have they disowned Jesus? Have they refused to agree with Jesus? Have they refused to follow that only Lord God, Jesus Christ? The opposition isn't only sensual in its exchange of grace, but it's heretical. It's heresy in its exchange of grace. John tells us in 1 John 2, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. 
Their denial of Jesus denies his lordship, that he is the master of our lives. And in the weeks to come, we will look at old and new apostates. We will get a little bit of a history lesson to help us out there in verse 5. But uh, we don't have time to do it today. And a little bit of review coming back from Nepal, getting back into our text, and we'll have the worship team come back up.